Today on the Home Winemaking Channel, we're going to talk about malolactic fermentation. What is it and how can you make better wine by gaining control over it? We're going to talk about a high level overview of malolactic fermentation, but if you want to really dig into a deeper depth about this topic, swing by my website, smartwinemaking.com. I've got a post on there where I really dig pretty deep into the subject. There are two big fermentations that are going to occur when making a wine. The first and primary one is going to be alcoholic fermentation. So that's going to be when yeast consumes sugar with a byproduct of alcohol and carbon dioxide. That's, that's really what's going to turn your juice or wine must into a real actual wine. Now there's a second fermentation though that plays a huge role in what that final wine tastes like, what that final wine smells like, and that's going to be malolactic fermentation. So instead of being kicked off by a yeast, this is actually kicked off by a certain bacteria. It looks a little bit like a bunch of little Mike and Ike candies in there. And what this malolactic bacteria will do is convert malic acid into lactic acid. So malic acid is going to be the acid that gives like a sour candy that sourness. It's, it's the pre prevalent acid in an apple. Um, it's, it's common in a lot of fruits and it's the second most or second uh, most concentrated acid in a grape with tartaric acid being the first and there's just a tiny bit of citric acid in, in a grape. So these little malolactic bacteria, they're, they're going to be there on those grapes, even in the vineyard. They could even be hanging out in a dormant barrel. They're just kicking around just like your yeasts are. So naturally, even without you adding malolactic bacteria, more often than not, the wine is going to try to go through a malolactic fermentation. So it's really worth trying to get a grasp on what this really means. Um, what can you do to either promote it, stop it, um, steer it one way or the other? Because this can really make your wine into just a little bit of a better wine and hit those stylistic goals that you're really aiming for. One really important byproduct of this malolactic bacteria converting malic into lactic acid is going to be the production of diacetyl. Diacetyl is what gives a wine like a Chardonnay that really super buttery aroma. Most red wines are going to have gone through malolactic fermentation and oftentimes you are going to notice that buttery characteristic. Sometimes it can be true just kind of butter Sometimes it can be butterscotch. And in a bad application, like a delicate white wine with a lot of diacetyl, it can actually be kind of like a sour milk characteristic. So there are some things you can do as a winemaker to control the levels of diacetyl, because that's really what's going to be the biggest factor you can control. You can either not do malolactic fermentation at all, you can do malolactic fermentation and, it, and in most cases you're going to convert all the malic to lactic but the diacetyl production is really what's going to change. You could produce a lot of it, make a butter bomb or you could produce almost none or at least be left with almost none and have this pretty smooth wine that just doesn't happen to be that buttery. So let's talk about some things you can do. Um, I'll start by saying I, I almost always will add my own malolactic bacteria culture. You can buy these as freeze-dried malolactic bacteria. They come in little packets. You keep them in your freezer. And what's, what's the beauty about this is you can get an ultra-reliable one. You can be kind of sure that it's going to ferment all the way through. You're not going to have this half-fermented thing where it's a little bit microbially unstable, it could kick back off in the bottle or something, you're going to have a good, clean, finished malolactic bacteria. But something you can do is you can decide when you're going to add it. 
If you add the malolactic bacteria during primary fermentation, when that wine's still bubbling, you're going to produce diacetyl, the butter component, but the yeast is actually going to break that down. It's going to irreversibly break it down. So one way to minimize diacetyl is to add your malolactic culture during fermentation. Another thing you can do is if you want to minimize diacetyl, kind of the name of the game is encourage a really swift, quick malolactic fermentation. So some ways to do that are to, you know, right when you're done fermenting, keep the wine a little bit warm. Um, you can also leave a little bit of lees on the wine. Lees are just all these yeast cells. So if those yeast cells enc encounter that diacetyl, they'll break it down. In most cases though, you're not really trying to minimize it. You're not necessarily trying to maximize it. You're just trying to, um, I don't know, just kind of match the, the amount of butter or diacetyl that you might want for that particular wine. Um, I would say normally what I would do is um, ferment the wine, press the wine, and rack the wine off of those gross lees, which are this big, you know, cake of yeast and pulp particles at the bottom of that carboy or that tank. Rack it off that, and then add your malolactic culture. And um, occasionally, I will let it stay a little bit cooler, like high 50s, but usually I'll kind of let that malolactic kick around pretty quick and keep that wine in the mid 60s to low about 70 for about a month or so. Let that thing just rip right through malolactic fermentation. You usually get a pretty nice and smooth amount of butter by doing it that way. It's nice and um, finished, which is to me very important because I don't sterile filter my wine. So I want to make sure that um, the yeast has consumed all that sugar on a dry red wine. I want to make sure that those micronutrients have been gobbled up by the yeast. I want to make sure that the the malolactic bacteria has converted all that malic acid. And then I also want to make sure that it has used up any leftover micronutrients. So we kind of have this nutrient free wasteland that other bad bacteria like um, acetobacter, which creates acetaldehyde, which creates vinegar, it's going to really struggle to get along in there. So that's what I would do. One thing I will mention is, I've said this before, you don't really want to make wine adjustments with citric acid, even though citric is the cheapest of the acids. The reason being is malolactic bacteria, when it's all done with that malic acid, it's going to jump on and try to um, metabolize citric acid. And when malolactic bacteria eats or metabolizes citric acid, what you're left with is acetic acid. Um, you're left with acetic acid and pyruvic acid. Uh, it will then take that pyruvic acid and metabolize that into diacetyl. So you still get more diacetyl, but you're getting a little bit of acetic acid, which is vinegar. You don't almost would never really want that in a wine. And, and probably the more harsh side effect is you just end up with so much butter in that wine that it's out of character. It's, you could swing into that kind of sour milk side of things, which, I mean, that's going to kind of make your wine virtually undrinkable. So steer clear of um, citric acid when you're making adjustments. Another thing I'll mention is that, you know, going from malic acid to lactic acid, you're losing a carboxyl group on that acid and you're gonna shift upwards in pH a little bit. So you really want to account for that early on when you're making any acid adjustments or when you're choosing when to pick those grapes. So if your wine is fermenting, you know, it might start at something like 3.4. During the fermentation process, it can often climb a little bit. It depends on some factors, how much potassium's in there. But if after fermentation you're at 3.5, you could end up at 3.65, something like that after malolactic fermentation. 
if you want to encourage malolactic fermentation, you really want to lay off on the sulfites after fermentation. You're going to want to keep that wine at a pretty low SO2 level, maybe free SO2 of somewhere around 10 parts per million. Um, this eventually microbial stability is a matter of SO2 and pH, but for this case, we'll say 10 parts per million. If your wine is pretty acidic, you're going to really struggle to complete a malolactic fermentation. So you're going to want to grab a, a freeze-dried malolactic culture that is especially good in a low pH environment. So um, I think CH21 is a good one for times when your pH is a little bit low. If you want to reduce diacetyl levels, you can ferment with um, something like a 71B yeast. 71B will consume malic acid. Um, the problem with, with 71B is that it will also create an ester that kind of has like a fruit salad smell, which maybe in like a white wine that's kind of an okay thing, but in a red wine it's a little bit too artificial smelling for what most people are going to want. If you want to increase diacetyl, the butter, you can... Um, Add a little bit of malic acid when you're doing acid adjustments instead of just strictly adding tartaric acid. If you want to completely prevent malolactic fermentation, this is actually a lot trickier than encouraging it to tell you the truth. What you're going to need to do is sulfite um, pretty, you know, a little bit heavier than normal after fermentation. Um, you're also going to want to keep that wine pretty chilled. Um, if you can keep it down around something like 50 degrees, you're probably, with a little bit of SO2, not really going to encounter malolactic fermentation, at least while you're at that temperature. You can use something called lysozyme. Um, it's relatively effective at stopping malolactic fermentation, or at least not allowing it to start. But the real, true, best way to... Um, make a wine that doesn't go through MLF or malolactic fermentation is going to be to sterile filter. So um, there are a couple home grade filters that do claim to do sterile filtration. It's really, really challenging to achieve a true sterile filtration in the home. Um, another thing I'll mention is that if you do perform sterile filtration, um, you're still going to have to do something to stop that wine from undergoing malolactic fermentation while you're kind of waiting for it to clear up. Uh, you're going to want to maybe, you know, keep it kind of cold, hit it with a little bit of those sulfites, and once it starts to get relatively clear, you can run it through the sterile filter, and, and then you can go and bottle and you're pretty much fine. The types of wines you would want to do this for is usually going to be white wines like a Riesling. Um, maybe like a Pinot Grigio or maybe a Sauvignon Blanc. Some of these wines, they just are a little bit better, kind of more crisp rather than more savory. Now, how do you test to make sure that you've completed malolactic fer fermentation? You can use paper chromatography. That's probably the most common thing for a home winemaker to do. You can use a... Um, so with a paper chromatography does. It'll just tell you if malic acid is there or if it's not there. It's kind of a pain. If you're just making six gallons of wine, just do what you can to encourage malolactic fermentation, and it's usually going to finish, especially if you add your own culture. So if you smell that's a little bit buttery, it's probably finished. Uh, you can use a spectrophotometer. That's what most labs are going to use. A little bit expensive for the home. Um, I could talk about malolactic fermentation all day. If you have any questions about it, make sure to mention in the comment section, or if you feel there's anything I missed, just say it down in the comment section, and I hope this was able to be pretty helpful for you. If you haven't yet done so, make sure to click the little subscribe button below and click the bell to be notified. Thanks for watching.